I mean, this, this has just been an incredible day. The, ide the ideas articulated and shared, the challenges raised, the larger justice issues that we've contended with, you all are extraordinary. And I'm so inspired, and this, this has just been amazing. So thank you. And I also want to take a, a moment to thank many of the people who helped to put together everything that happened today in terms of that village. And so Stacy, Elisa, they just slipped in and out. Can, so I want, to, I want to especially thank Elisa Sanchez here. And Camber Lamoureux. Yeah. And Stacy Tran. And then Diana Laughlin, who, who also just helped to pull everything, every, all the details together for today. Um, okay, so I now have the incredible honor of presenting the Initiative to End Family Violence's inaugural Changemaker Award. I have been teaching domestic violence clinics and domestic violence law for the last 13 years, and I constantly reinvent my teaching and revise my syllabi, but there is one constant. Right? <laughs> and Kimberly, your ears must have been burning all day today because you have been mentioned so many times. It's Kimberly Crenshaw's Mapping the Margins, Intersectionality, Identity Politics, and Violence Against Women of Color. I think everyone in this room who teaches, teaches, teaches this, and it's just such foundational work that is relevant more so than ever today. So everyone is familiar with this article in the Stanford Law Review. Students thank me for assigning it, right? <laughs> I had a student who recently said she'd been waiting her entire education, no, she corrected herself, her entire life to read something that spoke to her so deeply and that rang so true to her lived experience. The ideas, that, Kimberly, that you voiced about intersectionality and critical race theory 30 years ago changed the conversations and the movements in profound and essential ways and they remain imperative to the future of our gender and racial justice movements, and really the future of our world. Kimberly's revealed the multiple avenues through which multiple oppressions are experienced and how different forms of discrimination overlap and compound each other. She surfaced, she surfaced vulnerability to state violence through her recent campaign, Say Her Name, powerfully raising awareness of just how vulnerable women and girls are to losing their lives at the hands of police, and has issued critical calls to action to fight for visibility, inclusion, and an end to state violence. So when we created this Initiative to End Family Violence's inaugural Changemaker Award, we immediately thought of Kimberly Crenshaw, Executive Director of the African American Policy Forum, law professor at Columbia and UCLA Law Schools, Fulbright recipient, and leading American civil rights activist. So you inspire us, call us to action, and we are forever grateful. And so I wish to call you up to present you with this award and to thank you in advance for presenting this address to us on the urgency of intersectionality. Violence's inaugural Changemaker Award to Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, written on here for her revolutionary work on intersectionality. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank yes. you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you for that lovely introduction and thank you for the warm welcome. I'm really happy to join you today. I, I see some people I know, some former students that I've had. Um, and so it's just really a, a delight. Actually, to be back at Irvine, I, I spent a, um, I, was, I, I don't want to say a long year here. I spent a year here <laughs> at, the, um, uh, that, at the Humanities Research Institute and actually um, was finishing up mapping the margins when I was here. So actually this is somewhat of a full circle. I had just thought about that. 
Um, so I, I thought maybe what I might do is um, share some thoughts. This is more, you know, some um, thinking and drawing some connections more than a, a full presentation, um, partly um, because you've been here uh, for two long days, um, uh, deeply uh, involved in conversation that, that is vital at this moment. Um, and uh, it's the end of the day, so I just thought maybe what I would do is narrate a little bit about uh, mapping the margins relationship to uh, say her name and just end with a little bit um, of time spent uh, on the issue of say her name. So it, it was about 25 years ago, a little over 25 years ago, I was invited to a conference that was very similar to this one. Um, it was about gender-based violence and it promised to bring together advocates and academics, survivors and activists, white women and women of color, all to talk about what the next stages of what had been an historically grassroots movement uh, to politicize something that had at once been seen simply as a matter of pathology, family pathology, um, and it had been in the process of being politicized uh, into a question of um, uh, gender-based violence, um, more, uh, more broadly a question of patriarchy. Um, and it was a conversation that I think now in retrospect reflected some of the most vexing questions about what the future of the women's movement was going to look like. Now I had recently uh, published an article called Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex. It was a black feminist critique of anti-discrimination law. Now that article reflected my thinking at the time that law was not the only site at which race and gender had been uh, rendered mutually exclusive, um, leading to the utter erasure of black women who I was writing about in demarginalizing um, as uh, experiencing forms of discrimination that were in some ways uh, the same as men of color and white women and in, otherwise, in other ways quite distinct. Um, now, while it was clear that law was the culprit in the erasure of these unique experiences, it was not that distinct from the way that feminism and anti-racism engaged women who were not white and people of color who were not male. So there was, in short, a collusive kind of uh, quality to the way that law, as well as some of the broader rhetorics of social justice, had overlooked and marginalized the experiences of women and girls of color. But I'd assume that this was basically um, around questions pertaining to discrimination, questions pertaining to employment, or maybe even housing. Um, those kind of uh, traditional civil rights issues. My thinking at the time was that surely movements that were framed as gender-based uh, anti-violence movements would provide at least a predicate or a different template from which to articulate how women of color were experiencing these particular problems. After all, the entire point was to refine the way we think about violence away from the kind of standard trope of family dysfunction to looking at it as a condition that reflected the subordination of women. And if that was the case, then it seemed to make sense to expect that it would reflect women's subordination across all of their variations. The only challenge, I thought, was actually being able to get data that would help us think about that variation, help us politicize what that variation was telling us. So my efforts to do so began in Los Angeles, um, and as I explained in mapping the margins, because of the relative level of race segregation in Los Angeles, um, by actually getting reports from each precinct, I thought I would be able to create a rough cross-racial comparison of the incidents of police intervention in cases of uh, family violence. Now, <clears throat> I was told that the data existed. 
But as I was trying to get the data, brick walls were being constructed, and I would later find out that those walls were being constructed by people who called themselves my allies. So from racial justice allies, I was told um, that the data shouldn't be made public because it would reinforce the myth um, that communities of color were disproportionately violent. But there was a more specific articulation of it than communities of color. It was specifically stated in terms of um, reinforcing a belief that black men were disproportionately violent, therefore making it that much more difficult to challenge police brutality. So it, the idea went that as long as we're in a fight for our lives against police violence, we can't afford to create any impression um, that uh, policing black bodies is a more dangerous undertaking uh, than any other body. So only defeating the myth of exceptional violence could the um, challenge of police violence be um, overtaken. And so therefore, uh, the idea was that this particular need to find out what was happening to women of color um, had to be marginalized. Now, on the other side was my feminist colleagues, many of them who were white, who were arguing that, th that these statistics would reinforce the myth that violence was disproportionately of color <clears throat> or disproportionately poor. Um, and one of the main arguments that was promoted during um, the late 80s and the 90s was that violence isn't something that just happens to um, the mythical woman of color or just happens to poor women. It's something that can happen to middle class white women as well. And if you look at some of the testimony um, for the Violence Against Women Act, one of the standard kind of moments was, I don't look like I would be a victim of domestic violence. Now, what does look like mean? Right? So it, it more or less begged the question of what the baseline assumptions were um, that, um, that uh, many of our feminist uh, allies were trying to disrupt. So from their point of view, the success of this um, strategy depended on deracializing victimization. Um, and so the value of any data that more fully presented the risk facing women of color was just not substantial enough to overcome the threat that this evidence would be deployed to continue to paint domestic violence as a family problem affecting some families rather than a political problem facing all women. Now, I didn't have any language to describe what this combined demand for silence actually was at the time. What was clear was that information about women of color was literally being erased in pursuit of political objectives in which their interests were simply being marginalized. So what Mapping the Margins sought to do was to paint a picture that was um, that, that had been shrouded by these politics to tell the stories of what the consequences of these erasures had been, both for the women who fell between these political cracks, but also for the movements themselves. So it was both a story about specific ways that women of color were situated in spaces that were unnamed and untheorized, but also it was about the consequences of political discourses, rhetorics that themselves were not only not intersectional, but they were predicated on the particular kinds of power dynamics that the other movements were trying to challenge. So Mappings was trying to highlight the way that gender-based movements, particularly um, those more professionalized rhetorics, that eschewed any uh, kind of interrogation of racial power, and then how an anti-racist movement that itself uh, stepped away from any critique of patriarchy would not only end up abandoning those who were subject to multiple forms of subordination, but they would also undermine the reach of both movements. Now, you know, historically, um, this was this was not necessarily new. Um, we'd seen it happen in several movements. I mean, one need only think about 
the suffrage movement, for example, um, which uh, based its initial um, uh, argument um, on an idea uh, that um, uh, white women were more qualified to get the vote than uh, African Americans and immigrant men, that they were, um, they shared in a cultural, historical, and political project um, that could be defined as white supremacist and colonial. Um, so what was particularly insulting about denying white women the right to vote is that they were white. <laughs> Not just that they were women, but they shared um, a common uh, set of interests. This is what it means to predicate um, a claim of discrimination on a baseline uh, that itself is a reflection of discrimination of an other. So in, in our history of feminism, there had been moments in the past where uh, white supremacy was the baseline upon which claims for uh, equality on the basis of gender were predicated. And it's not just a feminist problem. And a lot of people will talk about um, that part, but they won't talk about the fact that anti-racism has many times been predicated on patriarchy. Um, another part of the work that we're doing in the policy forum is challenging contemporary ways in which racial injustice has been framed almost exclusively as um, involving men and therefore interventions like my, brother, my Brother's Keeper focuses exclusively on men and boys of color. Um, this is a continuation of a Moynihan frame which in 1968 um, was articulated as a justification for pulling back on civil rights intervention because the idea was that until the black family looked like white families, until the black family was corrected and made appropriately patriarchal, uh, black communities were gonna stay um, in a position of relative subordination and inequality. Um, that, that kind of argument is just like the suffrage argument. It takes as a given, a natural neutral baseline, the nuclear family, and then builds all expectations or lack thereof with respect to racial equality on one's deficit to with respect to that baseline. So th these, these have been problems in both feminism and anti-racism for as long as we've had feminism and anti-racism. The question was what would happen um, when those two uh, deficit models uh, actually came together. So much of mappings and the subsequent work um, was to try to build that argument, not only to address what fell between the cracks, but also to paint a picture about what those two kinds of arguments actually end up uh, enabling. So more recently, I've been framing this as um, intersectional failure. Um, not simply erasure, but intersectional failure. And these intersectional failures become rich grounding for neoliberal policies um, that uh, blame families, blame individuals, blame cultures, blame individuals for social problems, and also authorizes the use of criminalization and other kind of punitive measures as solutions to those problems. Now, um, the challenge that I think we face is in figuring out how we can still maintain the movements that we have without falling into these intersectional failures without actually enabling them to continue. So I, I wanna I wanna just I'm actually kind of curious about this. So I wanna try this. I, I, I do this generally when when I talk about say her name, but this is a, a slightly different context. So I'm I'm curious to see where this audience is gonna fall. Um, so since you've been sitting for a while, I'm gonna give you an opportunity at this moment to stand up, if you would. All right, some of you know what we're about to do now. <laughs> but I have some different ones for you, so don't think you know. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna say some names. When you hear a name that you don't recognize, and by that I mean you can't tell me who this person is or what happened to them, then sit down, okay? <laughs> 
All right. Mike Brown. Eric Garner. Tamir Rice. Wow, okay, you guys are good. I, like, no <laughs> one sat down. Okay. Ara Russer. The sound of silence. It actually makes a noise, doesn't it? I'm not done, I'm not done. So if you, if you knew Ara, keep standing. Okay. Janisha Fonville. Megan Hockaday. All right, so we have one, one person left that knows Megan? You had to sit down before. <laughs> and, and just let me get a show of hand. Who knows Megan? Okay, so it didn't change things too much. Okay, so you all know that these are all African Americans who've been killed by the police, or you probably infer it from the first group. And you also can probably infer that the difference between the first group that everybody knew and the second group that almost no one knew was gender, right? We know the names of men who've been killed by the police. We virtually know nothing about women who were killed by the police. So if this was just a conversation um, about state-sanctioned violence, I think we would actually see the point, right? But there's more here. The names of the three women that I gave you were not just women who were killed by the police. They were women who were killed by the police when the police were answering a domestic violence call. These are women that were killed within minutes. In the case of Megan Hockaday, who was killed um, here um, in California, in Ventura, um, mother of three, was killed within 20 seconds of the police arriving, shot in front of her children. So th th these cases um, remind us of the ugly underbelly of a pitched struggle that unfolded within our ranks um, around the question of police response uh, to intimate partner violence. In particular, uh, struggles uh, between uh, activists of color and professionals that were largely not of color around the reliance on the police and on criminalization more broadly as a solution to the problem of gender-based violence. And this shouldn't come as a surprise. Women of color in the 90s struggled mightily with their sisters over the increasing reliance on police intervention, legislated in part under VAWA, um, that made the enhancement of the police as first responders to domestic violence only part of a broader expansion of the power of the police to be responders to a whole host of social problems. Um, one of the most common um, risk factors leading to um, police killings of people in their homes um, is the role of the police as being first responders to mental health crises. So I could give you a whole nother list of names of black women killed by the police um, who um, were suffering a mental health crisis and their families actually called the police for help. Um, so this is part of a, a, of a, a deep um, uh, difference of experience uh, between communities um, who live in um, accurate anxiety about police and those whose basic um, uh, uh, reception of the police is more framed in terms of the police not seeing the problem rather than the police being a problem. This was a fundamental distinction uh, between the experiences of women of color um, and the experiences of um, their middle class uh, white sisters during the 90s. So um, the statistics tell us an even more troubling picture of some of the consequences of criminalization, some of the consequences of some of the um, laws and policies that were advanced by those who saw the problem as a failure of intervention as opposed to the way in which the police already were intervening in communities of color. So um, we know that 
um, of survivors who are arrested along with their abusers in New York City, the vast majority of those uh, survivors are African American and Latina. Um, we also know that in terms of uh, prosecution of women uh, who uh, kill in self-defense, um, black women are um, several times more likely to be convicted um, than their white female counterparts. Um, on the other hand, we also know, and I'm sure that it's been part of the conversation, that um, the prevalence of violence is also um, st statistically significantly uh, greater among uh, women of color, black women in particular. So what do we make of this challenge? Because black women in particular sit at the nexus between state violence and interpersonal violence, between laws that have underwritten violence in the name of self-defense and the operation of those laws that do not permit black women the same rights of self-defense um, as their white female counterparts. Now I wanna show you A tale of two defenses. And just ask what challenge this presents for us. So on one hand, there's Marissa Alexander, who many of you know, 31 years old, received a mandatory minimum sentence of 20 years in prison for aggregated, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. The facts are that her husband, um, who uh, was a known uh, abuser of her, threatened to kill her um, and uh, harm her newborn child. Um, she fired a warning shot um, in defense of her position in the bathroom. That warning shot um, was the um, act for which she was prosecuted um, uh, for, for this crime. Um, there was a several year campaign uh, to try to free Marissa from the 20 year prison sentence that she was given. At the end of the day, she accepted a plea to serve three years in jail and two years under house arrest. Um, she has to pay $105 every week to use an ankle monitor. She has to pay $500 every other week for the bond cost. This is the price of self-defense. Um, on the other side, you see George Zimmerman. George Zimmerman um, claimed self-defense after he stalked a 15-year-old. Um, he claimed that the 15-year-old had weaponized the sidewalk. Um, he claimed that his shooting the 15-year-old um, through the heart was in self-defense. Now, um, as you know, he was acquitted and did not spend uh, any time in jail whatsoever. These are um, two cases, both prosecuted, interestingly enough, by the same prosecutor, both in the same state, obviously, both um, under a stand your ground uh, regime in which supposedly you are able to defend yourself without having to retreat. Now the racial gender politics of how Stand Your Ground actually plays out are apparent in, the, in this case, and the data proves the point. So in Stand Your Ground states, um, African Americans are three times more likely um, not to be found to you, um, be able to use Stand Your Ground in the case of a homicide than whites, right? That's part of the conversation. But let's go even deeper than that. The tendency is just to think about race in terms of male-to-male -male comparisons. Let's think about why Marissa Alexander could not use Stand Your Ground. Let's think about what are the stereotypes about black women and violence that make it less likely for them to be able to use Stand Your Ground. And let's think about how those very stereotypes that make it less likely for Marissa to have been able to use Stand Your Ground also likely play out in what happens when police come 
into the home to arrest. It happens when police have to determine um, who is the primary aggressor. That might happen when the police, like the police officer that killed Megan Hockaday, encounter an African American woman. So there is the continuing relevance of stereotypes of African American women as being something other than women as not. Um, as being uh, more likely to engage in violence, as being more likely to engage in mutual combat. And in terms of many of the cases under, say, her name, um, individuals who present a threat to police officers, such that police officers are seen as being um, justified in using deadly force to suppress them. So um, I come to a point now um, where it becomes hard to talk about gender-based violence and not talk about gender-based violence that women experience at the hands of the state. It becomes hard to only talk about um, even sexual abuse and not talk about state-sponsored sexual abuse. Some of you probably remember um, last year the case of Daniel Holdsclaw an Oklahoma City police officer who was accused of raping 12 African American women, was, a, was convicted of raping eight of them, was given a sentence of 262 years uh, for his various crimes. What I want to hold up is, is not so much that he was convicted, which in and of itself um, was surprising to many, but the fact that this experience, that these 12 African American women had, hasn't shown up on the anti-violence agenda of any national women's organization. So when we were in Oklahoma City, um, we were pretty much there alone. Um, Gender-based sexual abuse at the hands of the state doesn't show up either as part of an anti-violence a uh, problem with respect to anti-black racism, nor does it show up in our traditional frames of gender-based violence. This has got to be where um, we begin thinking. Um, this is um, a problem that was suggested by some of the Justice Department reviews, but the full way in which um, women and women of color, um, uh, gender non-conforming women of color, uh, women who are homeless, um, socially marginalized women, the ways in which their intersectional vulnerabilities contributes to the violence they experience at the hand of the state just has not been the significant part of our conversation that it should be. So Say Her Name um, is an effort to draw attention to what actually happens in the shadows. Um, of our consciousness and of our movements. Um, it's meant to uh, resist the belief um, that state-based violence only happens to men and boys. It's meant to bring into our awareness that black girls as young as seven and um, women as old as 95 have been killed by the police. Um, they've been killed in their living rooms. They've been killed in bedrooms. They've been killed on the streets. They've been killed in their cars. They've been killed in front of their children and in front of their parents. They've been shot to death. They've been tasered. They've been stomped to death. They've been suffocated, and they've been manhandled to death. They've been killed when they've sought help. They've been killed when others sought help for them. They've been killed while they're alone and while they're with others. They've been killed driving while black, shopping while black, being homeless while black, having a mental disability while black, or having a domestic disturbance while black. They have been killed using a cell phone, sitting in a car reported stolen, and making a U-turn near the White House with an infant strapped to the back seat of the car. Now the fact that our anti-violence movement does not know these names is a testament to the narrow framework of violence that leads to the investment in police as solution and in the first place. So there's much that needs to be done. I want to suggest that we can start by, willing to, by being willing to extend our gaze beyond the women who are abused in the home 
to those who are abused by those who are, who are sworn to protect them. We have to extend our gaze to the long historical ways, in addition, that blackness compromised and denied black women the very presumptions of womanhood. It starts by bearing witness to the uncomfortable fact that humiliation and violence is not simply a problem of the state licensing individuals, but the state doing it itself, plainly and in plain sight. So to change the equation, I would suggest that we have to be willing to bear witness to these facts. And I wanna ask you right now if you'd be willing to join me in doing so. The African American Policy Forum um, has, um, as part of its Say Her Name campaign, assembled images that um, are uh, plainly in sight to elevate um, the experiences that many, many black women um, experience um, and to draw attention to their families who survived them, um, who are basically experiencing two losses, the, the loss of their loved ones and the loss of their loss, loss of their loss. People don't talk about it. People obviously don't know it. So um, I'd like to share the video with you and um, invite you to participate um, in reversing what happened at the beginning when we couldn't stand up for these women because we didn't know their names. Um, the video is going to uh, show some names of some women um, and you're welcome to say their names uh, as part of that. Um, at the very end of the video, there's a, a roll call of all the ones that, that we could find and, and they're, they're a fair number. Um, and we've, we've invited people just to call out any name that they want, um, not in some kind of orderly way, because this can't be an orderly m movement, um, but it can be a noisy one. Um, it can be one that's just filled with names to, to represent um, those who have been lost um, and our commitment not to let their losses be a loss to their families and to our community. So um, this is Say Her Name. Sasha, we're here to take you out. You promised that you wouldn't kill me. You promised that you wouldn't kill me. You promised. Mm -hmm. 
we say their names in order to set our intention to ensure that their lives were not lost in vain. The challenge, I think, for all of our movements is to build the bridges between them so that the loss of life to violence, whether it is through intimate partners or those who we think are to protect us from those in intimate partners, are all significant losses that require a movement to address them. I thank you for this wonderful opportunity. This um, recognition um, means the world to me. Um, it helps um, in those moments when our uh, small community of mothers gets another member to remember that there are others who are standing with us to support us in this work. So thank you very much. <laughs>